and the other world and worlds, other various crazy things that happen. So, so the thought is, well, it's, it's highly improbable that we would have all of those constants be just the right amount that we can be here. But if you take the point of view, well, that's just one of many possibilities. And based on the shape of those wrapped up six little dimensions, you could have many, many, many possibilities. We just happen to live in the world, the world, that has that set of parameters. But other worlds can exist with different sets of parameters. So that's another way in which the idea of a parallel universe. Uh, I think I said everything on this slide. Uh, roughly a stream theory timeline, I almost done, about two minutes ago, uh, began in the, in the 1950s. I had a nephew, in fact, who's a physicist who, who was a, a, a stream theorist. Uh, it began to wane, and my nephew, along with lots of other people, went into other areas of physics. Uh, it began to wane in part because there was so much emphasis being placed on the standard model, which, had, which was gaining so much acceptance and doing so well in describing things. But then this popularity increased around 1985. One of the problems, the problems with string theory, and prior to 1985, there were about five different theories. Uh, they almost talked about strings, but the mathematics was, was different. Five, five different ones, not there. Five different ones. Uh, Ed Witten showed that they were all good. He converted those five different ones into a simple one, and that really caused a great deal of interest to, uh, in the theory. References. Uh, I got started on this interest when Brian Green was here Monday of week one, two years ago. He's written three books. I read them all before he came, and I love them, and I love listening to him talk, and that sparked my interest in this whole thing. That's why I, I do follow this. His, the book that was most closely related to what I talked about today is called The Elegant Universe by Brian, Brian Green. You can also look at a website called superstringtheory.com get a number of ideas, and as I mentioned earlier, you can just Google any phrase that you want. Anything you've heard here today that you run into, just Google it, and you can get a world of information about it. So questions. Uh, sure, great interpretation. I actually mentioned the many worlds. Heisenberg and certainty principles. I didn't even mention that I must have lost the slide for that one. Parallel universe, or anything you have. Yes? Is that uh, where you go to find you want me back up to that? Yeah. Uh, come on up to the microphone, please, if you have a question, so that all the rest of the audience can hear the question. Uh, or, and we've got another mic. There, there is another mic someplace. They may be down here someplace. Yeah. Where, where was the question? Well, she just told me to back up a slide, so I thought oh, that would have. But other okay, questions. Just come up. If you have questions, come up, please. What are some of the predictions that string theory has made that you say can't be tested yet? But what kinds of predictions are we talking about? There's one, there's one uh, theory where we get the idea of many, of many worlds, uh, and there's a thing called a bubble, bubble universe, where the Big Bang is not the only, the only Big Bang, but rather there are, it's just one of possibly, to use the word infinitely, many. You know, Uncountable number of big bangs other places. And these other bubble universes, we use the word multiverse when we start talking about the beyond our universe, these other bubble universes conceivably could, just like ours, are maybe expanding. Uh, some of them might be because of the different parameters or whatever, but they could be expanding and they could eventually touch. predicted <coughs> what the background radiation should look like if two of these external universes, two, two of these separate universes, were to touch. And now some of you may be aware that recently there was a thought that maybe we found gravity waves uh, in looking at that. And it's very different. And we're talking with three degrees Kelvin is the, is the energy level of the, of the general background. Uh, and we, we, it predicts a certain pattern if they were to touch. So that would be one. Uh, the biggest problem is most of the predictions that they are so small. That, that we have no instruments to that can measure this thing. When we talk about small, uh, millions of times less than the size of an electron, for instance. 
let me take a, cha uh, a, a chance to, to challenge you. Uh, in the field of mathematical statistics, there's a concept called parsimony. And that says the fewer the parameters, the more believable is the theory. I'll quote John von Neumann. With four parameters, I can fit an elephant, and with five, I can make him wiggle his trunk. So how much of the 6, 10, or whatever dimensions is just a way of, of publishing a PhD dissertation, and how much of it do you think is really going to uh, advance this, the, the state of knowledge? OK, that's a great question. Um, you can't hear me? OK. Can you hear me now? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> The, that's a wonderful question. The uh, difficulty with string theory is it does introduce nine other, or six other dimensions, and therefore it's not as simple as one would like. There's a contender theory, I wish I remembered its name offhand, but if, uh, uh, I won't remember it, I'm sure. I think it's asymptotic. Asymptotic symmetry might be the name, but I could be wrong. If you, if you, uh, if you do a Google search for asymptotic symmetry, you'll probably come up with a website that lists about six contenders for string theory. So, the string, so and that one has the advantage, if, if I remember that that's the right name for that one, but one of the theories has the advantage, it only requires three spatial dimensions at a time. Uh, there's not as much work being done on that right now, but that would certainly satisfy the parsimony idea much better than string theory does. The, the largest uh, number of physicists working on string theory, I should say, more physicists who work on quantum gravity. That's the general term. Quantum gravity would, would encompass string theory, asymptotic symmetry, quantum loop gravity. Uh, more physicists who work, uh, more physicists work on string theory than any other of the quantum gravity theories. Uh, quantum loop gravity, I think, is second. A number of people think that this asymptotic symmetry, and I sure hope I'm right, but if I'm not, look it up and you'll get a list of about six and one of those we want to talk about. Um, and that one is beautiful in the sense that it only requires the three dimensions would need to parse any idea. Please come on. I'm in way over my head here, but I'm reading this book that mentions Milne and Dirac's dual time scales. Is that a familiar concept for modern physicists? Uh, it may be, but not to me. Oh. <laughs> I apologize. I, dual? Yeah, I'm not familiar to me. Okay. Let's get Bob Adams. Adams, we can have our resident physicist. Well, I'm sure. <laughs> uh, the recent uh, Scientific American has an article on the weirdness of dark matter. On the what? Weirdness. Weirdness. Of dark matter. Oh, yeah. And it occurred to me that the very concept of dark matter is based on our assumption that the strength of gravity doesn't change throughout the universe. I wondered if you had any comments on that, on the validity of that assumption about gravity. Okay, uh, there are two concepts regarding changing gravity that I'm familiar with. One, that it's constant, the strength of gravity is constant, and the other, that it, it doesn't change as you go around space, but changes over time. There's a, there's a thought that the strength of gravity might become less as time goes on. Uh, I'm not familiar with, the, with uh, the idea that many people would think that gravity is different values around other places, you know, in other places in the universe. The interesting thing about dark matter, which I think many physicists believe exists, is the, the thing that I've read about that makes it most understandable to me is simply dark matter has gravitational influence but does not interact electromagnetically. So in other words, electromagnetic radiation has absolutely no effect on dark matter. It's like light passing through glass. That has a slight effect, it will bend it, but even, dark matter has even less of an effect than that. Basically, electromagnetic radiation is not affected by dark matter. Gravity is, and that's how it is uh, hypothesized that it can exist, and yet we have 
no, no great way of seeing it other than the gravitational lens that it sometimes provides. I'm sort of a fan of the multiverse uh, or the branching interpretation of quantum mechanics uh -huh. because it uh, removes the observer, the specialness of the observer, particularly human consciousness of the observer, out of the interpretation. I'd be interested in your reasons why you've chosen not to be a fan of that interpretation. Okay. The thing that bothers me about that is that at every instant, at every place, that interpretation is saying that more universes are being created. Uh, as we sit in this room, almost an infinite number of universes are being created while I'm answering this question. And that just bothers me too much <laughs> to say that there. Now, I, I can accept the idea that we could have bubble universes through the string theory where they're all different because of the different shapes of the extra dimensions or for any other reason. I mean, even if string theory, if it turns out that the asymptotic uh, <coughs> idea is, is correct, whatever. I can understand that a bit better than simply every place, all the time, infinite number of universes being created. Have you considered the orders of infinity of the various variations of the universal cons uh, constants? There it, it continuous variation, so you have orders of magnitude of infinity of bubble universes as well. Absolutely. Oh, well. Uh, absolutely. Uh, the fact that we have 10 to the 500th possible shapes, each one of which producing a different set of physical constants, gives you a few possibilities. <laughs> Anything else? No, she's not. Yes. Well, my question is about scientific. It's only one thing. Um, who pays for all of this research? And how is the interest of physicists go about getting finance into this research? I, I can't answer that question well. Uh, much of the re research is done in universities, which is Brian Green gets. Uh, maybe uh, you know, there might be someone in this audience who has a better idea of well, exactly where the money is. We have a person here who's, who's very familiar with the National Science Foundation and the National Academy of Sciences. I think a great deal of physics research is funded by the National Science Foundation. So essentially, it's your tax dollars that pay for a great deal of this. Um, and there are internet, and it's some of the research is so expensive, that the CERN work that we were talking about earlier, that even all the funding coming from the United States isn't enough. But uh, many countries pool funds and have set up a super collider uh, on the border between Switzerland and France where these particles go spin around, and they, uh, a scientist has to go in and apply to uh, have time on that machine because it's, it's so expensive to do some of this research. Alice could describe a little bit more about how, uh, how where some of this comes from and, and uh, how the world works in terms of funding research. I can make no contribution to uh, understanding the physics of uh, the world. But uh, I should like to remind you that uh, about three years ago, we had a session, a whole week devoted to and I think the title was called Our Elegant Universe, yeah, which is the title. And Jennifer Wiseman gave the summary talk on Friday of that week. And she talked about the possibilities of more than one universe. And uh, I was reminded of a British uh, wise person whose name I cannot recall, who said, man's mind stretched to embrace a new idea never returns to its original dimension. And I think that's true in, in my field of biology. But I thought you, I mean, the, the third slide back uses universe in the plural, as though there may be several universes. And when Jennifer Wiseman made that comment at the end of her presentation on Friday of that week, I thought there must be two places where the universe, one universe might exist, containing the Milky Way and the solar system and so on, and maybe another place where there would be another universe. But what you're suggesting, I gather, is that the universes are a, are a conception 
of the mathematical realities of the, and I shouldn't say the world, of the universe. Anyway, you have stretched my mind in some other ways, so I'm now, now thinking that more than one universe is a different place, but in fact a different conception of reality. And uh, relating to your interpretation of what I said, I consider if there are, if there is this multiverse, multiple universes, uh, they are different places. I'm not thinking just of different concepts of a single universe, but rather the, the general thought in physics when you talk about a the multiverse is that these are different places. Uh, it could be the bubble universe I talked about, and another thought where, where the universe uh, instead of the extra dimensions being tied up in little tiny things, they actually are big. And we live in a three-dimensional world. We see a three-dimensional world embedded in uh, larger dimensions. And there could be another three or four or five dimensional world embedded in the, those multiple dimensions right next to us. So close we could touch it, except we can't because it's a different world. It's a di Just a quick question. You said you talked a lot about the three dimensions. Doesn't Einstein's warping of, of you know, light bending, that, doesn't that require a fourth dimension? Or not? Well, when, when we talk about Einstein's work, uh, when you normally hear fourth dimension, it's time. But I appreciate what you're saying. We, fourth we, spatial dimension. We, yes, a fourth spatial dimension. When we visualize, Einstein's warping. We always visualize a two-dimensional warping in, the, in our three-dimensional space that we can see. But if you were to truly understand the warping required in general relativity, I agree with you that the only way you could envision that would, to be, would be to envision, to see those three dimensions in a fourth dimension. Um, you can't visualize the three-dimensional warping but how do you visualize it in three dimensions? It's everything is warped. Everything is warped all around it. So if, I agree with you. You would need at least immensely a fourth dimension to visualize it. Doesn't mean it has to exist physically, but you would need a fourth dimension to visualize it. One more question. Is there a modern definition for the word or term universe? The, the modern definition that uh, physicists use, at least, is that the universe is the one we experience. Our Big Bang has created this huge thing 3.8 billion years ago. It's expanding and all that. That's the universe we know. At least we know a little bit about it. Uh, the word multiverse is then used to talk about the collection of universes where ours isn't the only one. There could be other universes, so we use the word the multiverse. Uh, Brian Green has a little cute little thing. He, just, he one time used a, a, a comment with his little three-year-old child, something like this. There's nothing in the universe like that. The little three-year-old child says to him, Dad, do you mean the universe or the multiverse? <laughs> Okay, remember, we, you have three assignments. On Tuesday, read the science section of the New York Times. On Wednesday, come here and experience a failure. And on Thursday, uh, go to the uh, room above the library, uh, in the library, in, in Smith Oaks Library, and I'm sorry, in, in the library uh, down here on Hunt Square, and uh, talk about the, uh, uh, what, what you've read uh, in the New York Times science section. Please, please thank our speaker today. And enjoy some dry weather for a change. And I thank you for coming. I enjoyed talking.